Hi. Good morning. My name is Kendall Fuller, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to East High School. As Des Moines' oldest and I'd say most prestigious school, <laughs> we appreciate the opportunity to host the State of the School event, as well as show off our new Ruth Ann Gaines Auditorium. Now, some of the things that... <laughs> Now, my experiences at East have been vast and wild, from having a cut-off freshman year to an all-virtual sophomore year. I feel like I've still grown in that time of being at East High School. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this morning's event will consist of two parts. First, the school board chair and the in interim superintendent will give a brief remarks about the work and goals of our school district. Second, assisted by two other East students, together they will respond to questions that have been submitted prior to this morning. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Des Moines School Board, Terry Caldwell Johnson. Ms. Cal Ms. Caldwell Johnson is well known for our community as a leader in local government and nonprofit organizations, and is currently the CEO of Homes of Oak Ridge a housing and human services agency here in Des Moines. She was first elected to the school board back in 2006 and, as chair, works with six other elected school board members in developing policies and priorities for the Des Moines public schools. Please give a warm welcome to Terry Caldwell Johnson. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here for our State of the Schools. I'd like to thank uh, Principal Versteeg for opening the doors of East High to us today. And of course, we are in the beautifully renovated Ruth Ann Gaines Auditorium, which we recently dedicated a few weeks ago. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the incredible students uh, that greeted us today, those that entertained us, as well as others that welcomed us. And finally, thank you, Kendall, for that introduction. Much appreciated. On behalf of the Des Moines Independent School District and my colleagues on the Des Moines School Board, I'm simply thrilled to welcome you this morning. Your attendance signals your interest in learning more about Des Moines Public Schools and the opportunities and challenges that are ahead. Um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our staff that are here today. I know that your colleagues in your buildings are undergoing professional development, so I know that as soon as we're done today, you're going to rush right back to your buildings to join them uh, to do the work that's ahead, but we really appreciate you being here. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank community members that have joined us today. I see a few of my Des Moines Schools Foundation colleagues that have joined us today. And um, seriously, it's just good to see you. It's good to be back uh, in an opportunity to share the state of the schools and um, really just a wonderful opportunity to update you on all of the amazing things that are happening for and with Des Moines Public Schools. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the individuals that I served with on the Des Moines School Board. Uh, my board vice chair, Kim Martirano, who is representing District 1, is here this morning. Thank you, Kim, for being here. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank my other school board colleagues. You know, it's interesting because I think this is the first time in the history of Des Moines Public Schools that we've had an all-female board of directors. So. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So like the female Navy aviators that conducted the pregame flyover at the Super Bowl last night, the women that join me on the school board execute their duties with precision and with purpose, and it's absolutely a thrill to serve with each and every one of them. So I was looking back into the history and I realized that the last time that we had a state of the school's address was 2008. When I moved into the role of school board chair, I determined that it was time to revive that tradition. So today, 15 years later, we are here to welcome you to the state of the school's address. 
As Kendall indicated, our format this morning will be very, very simple. Interim Superintendent Matt Smith and I will share a few opening comments, maybe more than a few, and then we will be joined by some East High students who will conduct and moderate a Q&A. Many of the questions that we will go through are ones that have been submitted by many of you in the audience and also some of our community members. So without further ado, Phil, let's move forward with the presentation. It has been 116 years since the voters approved the formation of Des Moines Public Schools. And the photo on the screen depicts students on the west steps of East High, likely the step, steps that you used when you came into today's event. I could spend all morning sharing with you a quick DMPS history lesson, but will suffice with just a few quick facts and highlights. W.O. Riddell was the first superintendent of Des Moines Public Schools. There are actually seven schools that remain in our facilities portfolio that were part of the original footprint of Des Moines Public Schools in 1907. We have had nine teachers since the inception of the Iowa Teacher of the Year Award established in 1958, and 17, I'm sorry, 13 of our uh, teachers have also received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Math and Science. We've had 92 state championship teams across our district and likely hundreds of individual champions in addition to that. And we have honored and recognized over 600 national merit finalists. So just to share with you a few of the notable individuals that have graduated from Des Moines High Schools. Um, Oscar-winning actress, the late Cloris Leachman. Um, Olympians, Natasha Kaiser Brown and Lolo Jones. High-tech entrepreneur, Ben Silberman. Leading edge scientist, Dr. Fang Zhuang. Governor Robert D. Ray. Major League Rookie of the Year, Jeremy Hellickson. World Series umpire, Eric Cooper best-selling author Bill Bryson, 21 NFL players, and Jimmy Fallon's sidekick, couldn't leave him out, Steve Higgins. I should also note that while he did not graduate from Des Moines Public Schools, fashion icon Halston attended both elementary and middle school right here in Des Moines Public Schools. So those are just a few quick highlights. Now I'd like to transition to who we are as a district. Des Moines Public Schools is Iowa's largest provider of pre-K-12 education in the state of Iowa. We are also the most diverse district, both racially and economically. And over 100 languages are spoken by the students that attend Des Moines Public Schools. I think that speaks to not only the richness of the diversity of our schools, but the incredible fabric and tapestry that we are able to create each and every day at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Our enrollment is really interesting when you begin to look at the trends that we've been following as a board over the course of the last several years. Since 2000, our enrollment has seen both peaks and valleys. Over the course of the past 23 years, we've seen shifts. And the most recent is in the last five-year period, which reflects the greatest shift in our population and enrollment with a loss of nearly 2,300 students. Now, this is really significant when we think about the financial implications of enrollment. And it is certainly one of the things that our board and our interim superintendent are tracking with rigor and regularity. Recent changes in state law threaten to further erode enrollment in Des Moines public schools, and quite frankly, public schools across the state. As you can see from this slide, nearly 44% of all DMPS students are elementary level. So continued enrollment strategies with our youngest students and a multi-year strategy across all of our student groups will really be how we intend to focus our intentions relative to recruitment and retention. So let's move very quickly to the impact of Des Moines Public Schools on our community. Des Moines is one of the largest employers in the region. 
Daily, over 4,700 teachers, associates, administrators, bus drivers, food service specialists, custodians, IT specialists, communications and HR specialists, in addition to technicians, counselors, and social workers provide the many, many resources needed to support the operational, academic, and enrichment needs of our district. Daily, our building staff manages over six million square feet of schools and facilities. That includes 38 elementary schools, 10 middle schools, and five comprehensive high schools. I'd like to now move very quickly to the work that the board has been doing around establishing our goals and our guardrails. Several years ago, the board adopted a student outcome focused governance model, which is predicated on a set of goals and guardrails that I'll share with you here shortly. Other districts across the country that have adopted the student outcome focused governance model include Charlotte Mecklenburg, Houston, Atlanta, Tulsa, San Francisco, Seattle, Albuquerque, and Long Beach. This governance model creates a clear structure for the superintendent to be accountable to the school board for the outcomes of all students. And it also creates an opportunity for our school board to be accountable to our community and our many stakeholders. Our goals are monitored by the board twice annually and focus on fourth grade literacy for all students and literacy and math proficiency for fourth and 11th grade African American males. Now you may wonder why African American males? African American males are the lowest performing subgroup of our entire student population. And we've entered into this notion of supporting them with the understanding that if we can get it right for them, we'll get it right for all of our other students. It's that notion of a rising tide lifting all boats. We've also established a set of guardrails, and these guardrails create a framework for goal attainment. The guardrails focus on equitable treatment of students, social emotional learning needs of marginalized students, demographic and culturally responsive teaching and learning staff, a safe and welcoming environment, as well as financial prudence. So I'm sure for those of you that have been tuning into our board meetings regularly, and I know that's everybody in the audience, you notice how regularly, but also with the level of rigor that the board begins to focus not only on the goals, but also the guardrails as our North Star for what we want to achieve for our students and our graduates. So now I'd like to move very quickly to uh, the superintendent search, which is something that I'm sure is on the minds of many of you in the audience and certainly on the minds of our community. Our very first superintendent was, um, I'm sorry, not our first superintendent, but our longest serving superintendent was John Studebaker, who served 17 years. And he went on to become the US Commissioner of Education under Franklin Roosevelt. Since 1907, when Des Moines Public Schools was founded, we have had 13 superintendents, which means that we've had an average tenure of those individuals of about 8.9 years. And currently, we are operating with our interim superintendent, Matt Smith. One of the single most important responsibilities of a school board is the hiring and evaluation of its superintendent. I want to thank those of you that participated in the outreach and engagement sessions we had at the end of 2022 as we began to set the stage for our superintendent search. Your feedback created a framework for the candidate profile that was delivered and developed by our search committee. I think you will agree that this is indeed a pivotal time for our district, our stakeholders, and our entire community. Whether you are a parent, a teacher, a member of the school board, we all must come together now around a shared goal of creating the best educational environment for our students, the best place to teach for our educators, and the best place to work for our administrators and staff. And that starts with the hiring of the superintendent. 
In November 2022, the board retained the services of a national search firm, JG Consulting, out of Austin, Texas, to lead this important endeavor. JG is a minority-owned and led search firm that has extensive expertise in recruiting diverse candidate pools and successfully placing individuals of color in urban school districts across the country. The firm has recommended and the board has affirmed that we will be using a closed search process for the superintendent search. Data tells us and recent searches in other parts of the country prove that a closed process yields the most qualified candidates and attracts the best and strongest pool of individuals to local processes. By way of reference, the most recent closed search in the state of Iowa is the recent search conducted by the Cedar Rapids School District, which concluded earlier this year. I think you will agree that we want the absolute best for Des Moines Public Schools. It is important to note that the 2023 hiring period entails an exceptionally competitive market. Both Iowa superintendents and urban superintendents across the country are being sought for opportunities for superintendencies and Des Moines is one in that number. The board will be walking a very fine line trying to balance the competitive hiring practices and job candidates' desires for privacy against the public interest and even the law. We have vetted the closed process with legal counsel and every element of the process passes legal muster. My board colleagues and I are confident in our decision and we will do our very best to keep you apprised of the details of the search process which are the superintendent, which are located on the superintendent landing page on the district's website. Throughout the process, we will continue to update the public on where we are in our four-phase selection process. We have developed a process that includes phase one, the application phase, and we are actu actually active in that phase right now the application review phase, which will happen along with our search firm, JG, at the end of February, our interview process, which will be a two-step process with semifinalists and a set of finalists that will be determined, and then the fourth step in our process is the naming and announcement of the lone finalists that the board will be recommending for a vote to be the next superintendent of Des Moines Public Schools. Stay tuned, there's a lot ahead on this process, and please reach out to board members if you have any questions about any element of the process, process but more importantly, about our decision to move to a closed process. So as I prepare to take my seat this morning, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't leave you with an assignment. So here we go. Number one, show up. There are so many challenges ahead for the district and we can simply not do it alone. We want, you attend, you want, we want you to consider attending our board meetings. Your feedback is vital to our decision making. Send us an email, give us a call, volunteer at a school, and be an advocate for public schools. Secondly, we want you to speak up. Des Moines Public Schools needs strong voices who not only support our district, but believe in strong public education. Consider joining our community legislative action team. There are several weeks left in the legislative session, so get informed. Show up at the Capitol, or if it's easier, simply contact your legislator and share your support or concern for any legislation that is being proposed. And finally, I'm gonna share with you my mantra, silence is affirmation. We can no longer afford to be silent as public education as we know it is being eroded at every turn. Speak up. And finally, I ask you to stand up. Stand up and choose Des Moines Public Schools. Our new tagline says it best. 
Come here to become here. If you are a parent with an elementary, middle, or high school student, choose Des Moines Public Schools. If you are a teacher, administrator, bus driver, food service worker, custodian, IT specialist, technician, counselor, social worker, please make Des Moines Public Schools your employer of choice. For 116 years, Des Moines Public Schools has educated, nurtured, cultivated, and graduated hundreds of thousands of students, no matter their race, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their religious affiliation, no matter their socioeconomic status, no matter their language proficiency, no matter their gender identity, no matter their special needs, no matter their developmental capacity. If you come to Des Moines Public Schools, there is no question that you will become the best you right here. Please choose Des Moines Public Schools. I'm glad I did for my students and I know you will be happy when you do it for yours. It is now my pleasure to introduce our interim superintendent, Matt Smith. Matt is a native of Houston, Texas, where he began his teaching career in 1999. He and his family moved to Des Moines in 2010 when Matt was appointed to the role of principal at North High School. In 2013, Matt transitioned from building administrator to become executive director of learning services before being promoted to chief schools officer in 2014. In July 2018, Matt was elevated to the position of associate superintendent, a role that he has held since 2022. Matt has a BS in secondary education from Baylor University and a master's in education, educational leadership from Sam Houston University. I can think of no better individual to be taking Des Moines Public Schools through this interim phase. Matt has passion, he has purpose, he is driven, and he is the single most energetic person I know. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Interim Superintendent Matt Smith. Well, Terry pretty much nailed it. <laughs> right there at the end there. Um, thank you so much, Terry. I'd be remiss if I didn't reciprocate that. Terry has been an amazing boss, a sensational colleague, and the best mentor an interim superintendent can have. So thank you so much. I've got so much I want to say. I know I'm going to try and stay on script. I'm going to do the very best I can. But I gotta start with this. So the day's already a success. I was speaking with a colleague this morning as he entered into the room. And last week I had the, the great fortune of being able to meet his son, who is a seventh grader in our school district. And as upon leaving the, the venue, this colleague said to his son, you just met the interim superintendent. Do you know that's your, that's your principal's boss, so to speak, but you just met the interim superintendent. And he replied by saying, I thought he would be much more plump. And so I am feeling really confident about myself right now. And uh, apparently, we might need to make an adjustment to the search criteria for the superintendent. So Terry spoke about Des Moines Public Schools, our history, where we've been, where we are, and concluded with if you come here, you can become here. That's what Des Moines Public Schools is about. Becoming a part of an organization, a part of a community that sees the value in you uniquely, what you bring to the table, your heart, your spirit, your mind. That's what we value in Des Moines Public Schools. In 2010, when I moved here, Every part of my being was captured by Des Moines. So much so that when we first moved here, didn't know where I was supposed to live, so I actually lived in Johnston, which is a, a beautiful community. Three years later, my family and I moved to Des Moines Public Schools because when you come to work in Des Moines Public Schools and you have it change your life 
and impact you and your entire family and how you see the world, you want your entire family to be a part of this school district 24-7. And it's been the greatest move for my family that I could possibly have asked for. That's the impact of Des Moines Public Schools. We offer unique opportunities more so than any other district in the state of Iowa. We offer so much that the rest of the state can't offer. You'll see a lot of these programs and a lot of these opportunities on the screen. We offer the only accredited public high school virtual campus. Our Career and Technology Education Center at Central Academy is the premier program for skilled trades and career technology in the country, not the state of Iowa, in the country. Absolutely. The programs at Ruby Van Meter that serve our most vulnerable population with genuine care, compassion, and a relentless pursuit in cognitive development. If you have not visited Ruby Van Meter, I would encourage you to do so. What those students and what those staff do on a daily basis is nothing short of miraculous, and they are living their best life because of the staff members that pour into them each and every day. It's an amazing program. We offer the only public Montessori program in the state of Iowa. Again, these are programs and schools that no other district in the state can offer their children and offer their families. That's what sets Des Moines apart. We have a diverse and, di and unique set of needs of families and students. And we rise to the challenge every single day and every single year to meet those needs to the very best of our abilities. We've also got a ton of accomplishments. So when you become here, that means that you achieve on a number of different levels. We've got staff accomplishments, we've got student accomplishments, and we've got organizational accomplishments, accomplishments that we're gonna highlight just a few. In terms of our educators, we have so much to be proud of. Johannes Alvarez is the Iowa World Language Educator of the Year. Educator of the Year. The Iowa World Language Educator of the Year. Deborah Carr won the Lifetime Achievement Award for the National Association of Social Workers. Frank Lee was named the Educator of the Year by Iowa Juneteenth. Not Des Moines Juneteenth, Iowa Juneteenth. Frank Lee, Educator of the Year. I know I'm, I'm hitting just a few of these, because you can read these. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just some of the highlights that, rep, that recognize and represent what we have to offer our families. We have some of the best educators in the state and in the country right here with us. And it's not just because they pour into the content. They pour into the students that are in front of them every single day. They pour in their minds, their heart, and again, you will hear me say they pour in their spirit because that's what educating is. It's giving all of yourself to those in front of you because they will give all of themselves right back. That's what Des Moines is about. When you look at our student accomplishments, there are so many. Again, we will not be able to actually spend all day long on these because we could spend three days talking about the student accomplishments. But if you look at um, Central Academy, we've got so many different programs that are offered at Central Academy. We've got not only state champions, but we've got national champions that come out of Central Academy. We've got state champions that come out of East, North, and Hoover for journalism. State champions. We've also got at Mary Jackson Elementary School, we've got a student group of elementary uh, children that led the charge to rename Andrew Jackson Elementary School to Mary Jackson. These are our student leaders. These are the young children that are in front of us every day that are saying, you don't have to do it all by yourself. We can do it with you. At the age of four, five, six, seven, eight, that's what's happening in Des Moines schools. We've got children leading the charge to a better future for us. That represents Des Moines. We've got winners inside the classroom. We've got winners outside the classroom. There are so many different accolades that we can actually name. We've got state cross-country champions out of Roosevelt. We've also got uh, district-wide a girls wrestling team this school year. Four of these young ladies qualified for state. When I first moved here in 2010, I didn't know what a singlet was. 
And by God, 13 years later, we got four young ladies qualifying for state in a state uh, wrestling tournament. We've also got at Roosevelt High School a dance team that won the 2022 state championship. State championships. That actually is what we are about. It's about high achievement. It's about pouring all you have into every opportunity presented in front of you. And Des Moines Public Schools is about access to opportunities. We've also got a number of organizational excellence accolades that we want to lift up. Des Moines Public Schools has changed the hearts and the lives of so many others. We are, every single year, we win awards around our environmental accolades and the investments that we pour into um, clean resource energy. That saves us money. That saves us money to spend on children. 11 years running now, we have some of these awards. We have also uh, got a new partnership with the University of Nebraska because we need to be a part of the solution of the crisis of human trafficking. So when we talk about Des Moines Public Schools as being the premier educational institution in the state, it's not just because of what happens in the classrooms from 7.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's about what happens afterwards when we're meeting with community partners. Many of you are represented here today. It's about what happens when we uh, invest in access and opportunities in crisis management across the state. What I love about Des Moines Public Schools, more so than anything else, it's about the human experience. It's about humanity. It's not always about being right. It's not always about winning. It's about doing what is right for your neighbor. It's about doing what is right because it's just and it's equitable. And standing on that firm, that's what Des Moines Public Schools is about. We have teachers and staff willing to do whatever it takes to change the hearts and the minds of those who don't see Des Moines Public Schools the way we do. That is the ultimate sacrifice. That is the ultimate sacrifice as an educator when you are willing to change what you are doing because you love that person so much. You change what you're doing when it's not working. That's what I see every day. We can lift up a lot of accomplishments and a lot of accolades. But nothing compares to walking the hallways, walking in the classrooms and the cafeterias and the spaces where students and staff interact and you see them change one another's lives because of how they pour into each other. I could never be prouder than I am right now. And what that requires of us is to use our dollars wisely. We gotta keep teachers in front of kids. We gotta have those wraparound supports in front of our students. So I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about budget because I know that's that time of year. And we often talk about budget at this time of year, uh, but I will tell you it's a 365 day conversation when it comes to budget. So when we think a little bit about um, our investments and our expenditures, what you have in front of you is the overall revenue of funds. This is how Des Moines Public Schools collects dollars so that we can serve our children to the very best of our ability. And what you'll see is that the predominant funding stream is that of general fund. That's where most of our fund comes into play. The next slide is gonna represent the general fund broken down with the predominant percentage being spent on instruction. Because we are a teaching and learning organization, so it makes sense that 60% of our budget, of our general fund budget, is spent on instruction. And that's what we're gonna end up talking about today. I have no doubt that there's going to be a question today about how was Des Moines Public Schools optimizing your funds to better serve our students, our staff, and our families. Before I close out and invite two special students to the stage to help moderate this conversation, I have this interim position for a little bit longer, so I'm gonna leverage it right now. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot that gets sensationalized that really shouldn't be. The difference makers are the ones that are in the room. You can bring hope 
to a generation of students right here today based on what you choose with the information that you hear about and who you speak with and when you walk out of this room. If we are to change the outcomes for our students, we have to allow hope to begin that conversation. I'm standing in front of you today never more hopeful than I have been in the past because I get a chance to see you, our students, our staff, our families come together and speak up when something's not right. True change starts with hope. We gotta have hope. Des Moines Public Schools is all about fostering hope for children, for staff, for families. I am super excited about the FY23 school year and even more excited about the FY24 school year to come because we have you. We have you as colleagues, we have you as partners, we have you as staff, and we have you as family. So, Ms. Caldwell Johnson, before we begin our conversation, again, this second part of the conversation, this is the meat and potatoes of the event today. It's the Q&A, and we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation here, so I'd like to welcome to the stage Josue and Samantha. As they are making their way up here, uh, we're gonna do a quick little, uh, not wardrobe change, but we're gonna do a little bit of a, uh, a shuffle here. But I do want to recognize that Jose and both Samantha are part of the Iowa High School speech and debate teams, as well as the national speech and debate teams, and they are active members in the musical. This is Josue and Samantha. All right, so we got some nice little questions to ask here. Uh, I chose an, a, an easier one to begin nice with. Nice little easier. question. It, it's the okay. warm-up, it's the warm-up. <laughs> All, right. All right, we'll start off with, our elected representatives from Des Moines seem to support public education, but what can we do to convince suburban and rural Iowa lawmakers to support public schools? And I'll, I'll uh, hand this mic over to you. Uh, oh, you got mics already? Yeah, perfect, perfect. You wanna start? You wanna start, Terry? I'll let you start. Okay. <laughs> What could we be doing? I, um, I think that's a great question. It, it's not a simple question because I think it's profound. Um, I think we have to tell our own story. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we rely on the fact that as educators, we are, we, we come from parts of service. We come from, we just want to do what's right. We want to do what's just uh, when, when it's right in front of us. And oftentimes we, we forget that part of our our role, part of our responsibility, is to be voices um, with our students and with our families about what's actually happening in our school district. And, and all the, again, all the achievements and all the accolades um, are part of that conversation. But a lot of that is about truth telling. It's about the stories. It's about the successes of our students and our staff and our families on a daily basis. Those small wins, those small miracles that happen each and every day. And there's not a day that goes by that those do not happen. Being able to share that in a very public light brings attention to what's actually happening in Des Moines Public Schools, the truth of what's happening in public schools. I think it's, it's about storytelling. So I'd just like to ask by a show of hands, how many of you in the audience are products of public schools? I dare say that the numbers that are represented in, in this audience are also the numbers that are represented in the Capitol. The majority of those folks likely are a product of a public school. And I'm not for sure that the, whether or not they've forgotten <laughs> about their public school education, um, but I was sharing with Barb Adams a little earlier today that this really isn't a decision about the people of the state of Iowa relative to their support or lack thereof for public education. This is about the politics that are in play across the entire country. 
and Iowa is just part of the demise of what people are hoping to bring to public education. But what I'm going to tell you is that not on my watch. I am not going to allow it to happen in Des Moines Public Schools, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that those students that come to Des Moines Public Schools become their best selves at Des Moines Public Schools. Okay. For your next question, which academic programs are showing the most promise for improved outcomes for students in the elementary, middle, and high school? Uh, the most promise, great question. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head I can point to a specific program. What I would tell you is that our, um, our energy and our focus around um, early literacy is showing great promise. Um, you know, we've got um, a phenomenal curriculum in EL, we've got a phenomenal math curriculum in IM, and what is happening is we are beginning to coalesce as an organization, um, and again, we've got about 2,000 teachers here in Des Moines Public Schools, where um, GLEAM instruction, right, and GLEAM instruction is that grade level engaging, affirming, and meaningful instruction is taking place and taking hold every day in every classroom. Um, so our early literacy um, focus is really beginning to take off, and we're starting to see a lot of results out of that. Um, at the middle school and high school, same sort of answer to that. What I would add is um, I'm just really impressed uh, with our efforts to scale after school programming at the middle school and high school level. There's so much more that we can do there, and there's so much more that we can continue to grow and um, uh, add to, but the, we're not just a, a pre-K-12 um, learning factory. We, our job is to actually pour into the whole child. Our job is to create spaces and places where students can show up to be themselves um, and can grow to be the people that they were created to be. And so what requires uh, of us for that to take hold is we have to be m more than just a learning environment. We have to be an environment that cultivates the entire person, their, their spirit. We have to have those after school programs that support students um, in their interests. We have to have those career opportunities. We have to have those post-secondary opportunities and those pathways. So uh, I guess I would offer that um, we have a holistic approach to serving children. And I, I just, it, it's benefited, um, I mean, thousands every single year. It's, it's one of those things that you just can't say enough about. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so much of what happens for our students happens during the school day, but a lot happens after school. Uh, we have some amazing community partners across our entire district that are providing incredible support uh, for students and their families in the after school setting. Uh, they focus um, on academics, but they also focus on enrichment in ways that we continue to support those students once they leave um, our school buildings. So I would offer that um, in addition to the amazing work that our teachers and staff do in the buildings every day, we also have an incredible cadre of community partners that continue to support the learning that happens after school. And I think when Matt speaks of this notion of educating the whole child, we do that 24 seven um, and it's with intention and I think it's with the best interests of our students at heart. You know, and I would add to that, Terry, um, as we're, because this is a conversation, um, so I'll, I don't need to wait for the next question. So, <laughs> an example of that is, is a partnership uh, with the city of Des Moines, who has also now just invested $3.9 million for six additional pre-K classrooms, as well as some uh, community partner classrooms over the next three years because that level of investment is about investing upstream to make sure that we are setting students and families up for success. And what I want to also highlight in that particular investment is that's an investment in the family. That, that's an investment in the workforce because when parents can send their children to a learning environment that is safe, that is structured, that is going to love them as if they were their own and parents can go to work full time, that's what this is about. Those are the programs that are successful um, and those are the programs that last and are, and are impacting entire families, not just the children that we serve. Yeah. So just to add on to that a little bit, Matt, too, you know, you're talking about a dual generation strategy. Yeah. At the same time, we support the needs of students, we're supporting the needs of parents, and together, 
I think we're having some amazing success across the district. Absolutely. All right, great. I did say that was going to be the warm up, so it oh. gets a little. Oh, uh oh. oh yeah. Turn it up the heat, huh? Oh, yeah. All right. The politically popular thing to do right now is to ban books that are uncomfortable for some, including those about LGBTQ families, youth, slavery, and racism. Will you be banning books in the DMPS libraries? Absolutely not. Okay. You know, I know my history, and my history is important to me, but it's equally important to everyone else. You know, we have students of all races, colors, ethnicities, backgrounds, gender identities, and they deserve to be represented in everything we do, in what we present, and also in how we present. So I say absolutely not, not on my watch. Yeah. To double down on, on Terry's comments, we can't be an organization that says we value the whole child, we value the whole family, and we're here about creating um, a loving environment and then turn around and exclude the very people that we serve. Yeah. So we have to be, we have to commit to who we say we're going to be, which is we're going to love you unconditionally, we're going to um, celebrate you, and you're going to be represented in our, in our spaces, in our places, because it's the right thing to do as a, as a, as a part of the human race. This is about serving and loving one another to the very best of our ability. And when you get into an exclusionary environment, you strip that dignity away from people. You strip that respect away from people. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to be about that. No. Nope. Love to hear it. OK. What is our plan for the budget moving forward now that state funding is being given to parents who elect private schools? So I can start. Um, okay. We absolutely have to make some difficult decisions regarding our budget. Um, and this has been going on for the last 10 years, at least, in terms of uh, budget cuts and reductions. Our reduction for the upcoming FY24 year is about close to a $10 million reduction that we have to make. And so what we have to do is continue to um, analyze and um, investigate the return on those investments in terms of where are we spending our dollars and where can we actually reduce those dollars and place them other, um, in other spaces. Um, examples of, of how we partner to get that done is just like working with the city and looking at knowing that we have to invest in a pre-K environment, uh, that we will continue to provide our dollars in that area of supports for students and families and working with the community, in this case the city, to invest their dollars in that very same um, early childhood experience. I think we have to continue to look at um, our physical plant structures. Um, we want to keep staff. Uh, we want to keep teachers in front of children. We want to keep the support staff in front of our children. And so that's going to be the most important thing, uh, that our reductions come at a uh, central office level, and that in terms of physical plant structures. Yeah, we started our budget hearings um, a couple weeks ago now, a week ago actually, tomorrow. And um, I've been on this board long enough to see the good, <laughs> the bad, and the ugly when it comes to budgeting. Um, I was here when we had mid-year cuts, where we had to actually make cuts in the middle of the fiscal year in order to accommodate the limitations of our budget. I've also seen it when we've been able to make shifts and changes in our expenses that kept things as far away from the classroom as possible. And now we're here today in 2023 where um, as much as we would love to keep every single cut away from the classroom in order to meet a $10 million deficit it's just not doable. But we're going to do our best to cut everything else before we cut a teacher and impact a student. So I would offer that um, as we're going through these deliberations, please let us hear from you. You know, come to our meetings. Listen to the tough choices that we as board members are being asked to make when it comes to the fiscal situation for our entire district. Just a quick fact, and Matt shared this on the screen, but um, 80, over 80% 80 of the cost associated with operating Des Moines Public Schools is in our 
um, salaries and benefits. Um, typically, on an annual basis, um, our cost of union negotiation and our cost of operations are going up ahead of what typically we get from the state for state supplemental aid. Uh, this year, uh, we got 3%. And I dare say that once our union negotiations are settled and the cost of doing business for our teachers and the balance of our staff is settled, that we likely are going to be above 3%. So we're already starting out in a negative. So I'm going to encourage you. One of the things I said in my comments was to speak up. The state legislature needs to hear from you. It's amazing in a state, of I a state like Iowa that indicates that they value and treasure education that they chose to fund private education before they made a decision about the amount of money they were going to give to public education. That's not the Iowa I don't know. I don't know about you, but that's not the Iowa I know. And we've got to do better. So the people in the legislature need to hear from you. They need to understand not only the value of public education, but the value of investment in public education. It's critically important. And just to give you another data point, and Terry mentioned it earlier, you know, over the last three years, we've lost approximately 2,300 students. And that equates to about $15 million of revenue. And so when you have low supplemental state aid and loss of student enrollment, it compounds on one another to the point where we've got to make some significant cuts and some, some significant reductions, but also looking to the FY25, FY26 ahead of us. So this is not just about making reductions for FY24. It's about looking towards FY25, FY26, and knowing what our outcomes are and what we need to actually reach and what we need to do to get there, and then making decisions based on that. All right, and this question kind of uh, follows up on that, actually. So besides increasing per-student funding or ending the voucher program, what is the most helpful thing we can ask Iowa lawmakers to do to help students succeed? Leave our public schools alone. We are doing just fine. We don't need your interventions around curriculum, what we teach, how we teach, who we teach. Des Moines Public Schools has been in existence for 116 years, and we've been doing pretty darn well. So don't mess up something that doesn't need to be fixed. We're doing fine on our own. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a real danger in suggesting that individuals need to be fixed. Um, and I think a lot of times what happens is conversations, uh, whether at a local, state, or national level, are oriented towards someone needing fixing and what that does, and not recognizing that what that does is devalues that individual and it, it puts organizations in a, in a position where they feel um, either incredibly defensive or that they have to solve some problem about some individual or some groups of individuals that is just not true. It's just not true. And so, again, a, a, a district like Des Moines is not about fixing individuals. Individuals are not the problem. The people are not the problem. It's always the system of supports that we have to look at. And so we have to begin looking at the system of supports from the state level, the system of supports from the national level, our own local system of supports. That's where there's opportunities for us to, to make shifts and changes. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the people within the system. Our people are just fine, to Terry's point. There's nothing that needs to be fixed in that regard. Okay. DMPS held many public forums to talk with the community about safety in schools. What was your personal takeaway on that? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's, uh, my personal takeaway is there's a, a sort of a duality there for me in terms of how I feel. I feel um, saddened and it's, it's sobering to know that um, 
there's just a great deal of pain and suffering in our community. And at the same time, it feels hopeful when folks gather around a table, and in these cases in our community roundtables that started last year, we've already had another round this year, and we'll have another round in the spring. It's hopeful to know that folks gather, um, not just in moments of crisis, but they gather around tables to literally break bread and share ideas about what we can do to be of better service to one another. And that, that, that fills my soul, it, it fills my spirit, and at the same time, it's not lost on me that um, there's a ton of tragedy, uh, tragedy around us, and we still have a long way to go. Um, I would challenge anyone that would suggest that our schools are not safe. I would challenge that all day long, not only with data, um, and we can, we can provide the data, we can put it up on the websites, we can send it out, because uh, again, there's a, there's a phrase that, that, that I've used before um, that says, in God we trust, but everybody else bring data. There's a lot of things that get said out there, but if you provide it with some data to back that up, our schools are not unsafe. Uh, what gets sensationalized is something that happens here or there, and then it gets sent across the media thousands of times over. What we should be sensationalizing is all the good and learning that's taking place and all the positivity that's taking place, all the acts of service and kindness that's taking place on a daily basis. That's actually what we should be sensationalizing, and we got to do a better job of that as a community and as a state. That's a long one that answer to your question, which is um, I feel hopeful about where we're headed. I feel hopeful about the fact that we're having real conversations as a community um, about what is and is not happening in our schools and in our community, because I do think we have to talk about safety as a matter of a community conversation. The schools are a part of the solution and can be a part of the solution, but I would certainly challenge anyone that said that we are the problem. Yeah, I would concur. Um, you know, we see it all around us, um, the acts of violence that are perpetrated against innocent victims, whether it's in our neighborhoods, uh, whether it's in our schools or whether it's in our community at large. Um, what's happening in Des Moines Public Schools is really a microcosm of the things that we see happening around us each and every day. And um, if I had a magic wand, I would wave it and get rid of every gun that's out there. I would wrap our kids with love and let them know that they're valued and they don't need gangs, they don't need guns to make a difference. And I think in so many ways, the community conversations that we hosted created a space for us to have those intentional conversations about what's happening, not only with our students and in our schools, but ways that Des Moines Public Schools can be part of a larger solution. So I agree with Matt that we're just a reflection of all of the things that are happening around us. But when you get to the bottom line and begin to look at the data and the facts, our schools are safe and our kids are doing well. You know, and connected to that, there's a lot of hateful things said, you know, in lots of spaces. Um, again, locally, state level, and, and nationally. I will never be a believer that you combat or you fight hate with more hate. You have to, you have to fight it with love. You have to fight it with compassion. And I'm proud of our community. I'm proud of our community for not settling on this idea that this hateful rhetoric is, is just what we just have to deal with. We don't have to deal with it. We could actually show up to a table, have dinner together, talk about what's taking place, and come to a different idea, a different perception, a different strategy about how we better serve one another. I'm super proud of our community for continuing to invest their time and energy in doing so. All right. So, without mentioning either funding from the state of Iowa or the effects of COVID, which are two things beyond our immediate control, please outline some concrete steps to improve educational outcomes for under-resourced youth. Well, I would start with um, all of the amazing partners that we have. I think we have to recognize in um, an environment where the resources that we need um, are just not available to us. Being able to do what we do best in Des Moines Public Schools and leaving the rest to our community partners is for me where the rubber meets the road. So really being intentional about creating and investing in those partnerships that allow us to extend our school day into communities and neighborhoods supporting students and their families, but also recognizing that when you are under-resourced, you have to put your resources 
where they can best meet the needs of students. And for us right now, it's classrooms. So our community partners and our community at large is gonna be a critical part of how we begin to continue the success that we've had for Des Moines Public Schools and our students into the future. Yeah, and there's, I think there's a lot of um, answers I would provide there. Um, I'll keep it focused on, we've got to invest in preschool um, as a city, as a, as a district, as a state. We've got to give kids early access uh, to a high quality preschool education. We can't call it voluntary preschool if you don't have access to make the choice of whether or not it's voluntary. If you don't have the choice to make it, because it's not available to you, then it's actually not voluntary at that point in time, right? It's, it's, there's a barrier that's put up in front of you. So access to high quality preschool is an absolute game changer, um, not only for our students of today, our four years of today, but for their families and for those four-year-olds' future. There's all kinds of data to support this and all kinds of research to support this. The other is that high quality um, educational experience in the pre-K through 12 environment. Um, again, we are making leaps and bounds and gains in creating a consistent experience for students to receive grade level engaging and affirming and meaningful curriculum instruction on a daily basis. And that's what we have to continue to grow to. Um, we use the phrase a lot in Des Moines Public Schools that we can't intervene our way out of achievement gaps. And that's absolutely true because high quality instruction has to happen in core, it has to happen in extended core, and it has to happen consistently every day. And the way we do that is we pour into the adults that are serving our children every day, right? That's professional learning experiences, um, providing with that high quality um, of curriculum for them to learn from and to teach from. That's all part of the, the cohesive plan to create the most optimal learning environment for students, not only to gain the knowledge and skills related to the content, but to gain those social emotional skills by being put in, in student teams to, to learn from their, their peers. That's the social emotional learning aspect that we're looking for in all of our classrooms because we're not just there to again um, to receive and then regurgitate content. We're there to grow as individuals. We're, we're there to grow as people. Um, and in doing so, we're moving towards graduation with a plan for post-secondary or, or a career um, in the military or just a fast track to the career world. We've got all of those pathways and creating those opportunities for students and for families. I'm going to continue to say for families because we're not just about the student. We are absolutely about the family. But doing so in a manner that everybody knows what their access is and how they actually get to wherever it is they desire to be. Um, and I am recognizing that we are about five minutes over. Um, so I think we've got time for one more question before we close up um, and make sure that everybody gets to where they need to be and before you grab um, a bag and a cookie on your way out. Um, but I think we've got time for one more question. Okay. How can parents and community members support our neighborhood schools? Oh goodness, there are so many ways. Um, at the elementary level, join the PTA. At the middle school level, you know, volunteer. At the high school level, be a booster. Be part of the high school experience for your student. Um, the other thing that I would offer is just selfishly from a board perspective, uh, we need our community to show up for our public schools. Um, we educate over 30,000 students every day. And if we had parents of those 30,000 students speaking up, showing up, standing up for public education, can you imagine the kind of difference we would be able to make? So I would challenge any and everybody who is a lover of public education, a supporter of Des Moines Public Schools, an investor in our community, that public schools is really where the rubber meets the road. We need you, we need your support, and please show up for our students. It's critically important. I can't add anything. Double down on that. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, I think that wraps up our questioning period here. <laughs> Josue and Samantha. So to wrap up, um, just want to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your commitment to our 30,000 students, staff, and, and families that we all support every day. These are good times. They're difficult times. But they can be good times. They can be the best of times if we actually pull together and we work incredibly hard 
to be relentless in our focus and our pursuit to creating the kind of environment where all of our students are thriving, not where they're just surviving. We can do better. We're doing really, really well. But we can do so much better. But we need each and every one of you to be a part of that. Terry? I'm just going to uh, close by saying, um, come here, become here. Des Moines Public Schools has an incredible history of educating hundreds of thousands of students. And I dare say that we have so much upside ahead. And it be it's because of those of you that have joined us here today in the audience and a community that I know believes in, supports, and wants the best for our students and really believes that public education is so critically important to our future. Thanks for joining us today for our new and improved State of the Schools Address. Hope you'll join us again next year. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for showing up. Thank you.